I want to introduce the futures contract. But before I do that, let me talk a little bit about derivative securities because a futures contract is what's referred to as a derivative security. Now, derivative securities get their name because they derive their value from some underlying asset. That is, they don't have value themselves. They have value because of the underlying asset, which is different from, let's say, a stock or a bond. In the case of a bond, you receive certain cash flows, interest, and then the return of principal when the bond matures. So the bond itself actually has value from these cash flows. And the same with the stock. If you own a stock, you may receive dividends quarterly. Again, that's the reason the stock has value. But in the case of some of these derivative securities, the only reason they have value is because they derive it from some other asset. So some of the different types of derivative securities, uh, there's a forward contract. Now this is a contract where the terms are agreed upon today, but where delivery takes place at a later date. Now, a forward, con a forward contract might be used by the importer, an importer. This, this person is going to need a certain amount of, let's say, euros in order to pay for whatever it is he's importing, so he's worried that the euro and dollar exchange rate might change, so he goes to his bank and he says, look, I would like to lock in a forward contract and I will give you a certain amount of dollars today, uh, at a later date and receive a certain amount of euros. So he knows that he's going to be giving one million dollars and receiving, let's say, 1.2 million euros. All right, I'm just making up this number. And so it doesn't matter what the exchange rate is on that date, they've already agreed to the terms. A non-financial example of a forward contract that you might be able to relate to perhaps a little uh, more easily would be the case of, let's say you took a job in Europe and you're going to sell your car because you're not going to take your car to Europe and your friend Bob needs a car. So it's January 1st, you've taken this job, you know you'll be leaving um, in early June. So on June 1st, you and Bob agree to the fact that he's going to take delivery of your car and he's going to pay you $6,000. No money changes hands today, but the exchange takes place on June 1st. That's a forward contract. Now the problem with forward contracts is they're privately negotiated, which makes them hard to value and hard to trade. Now the advantage of them is that they can be customized to meet the needs of the two participants, which might be a company and a financial institution or two financial institutions. A futures contract is essentially a standardized forward contract. So the terms are standardized, which makes it much easier to trade and we'll discuss more of that in a moment. Two other types of derivative securities which I discuss in more detail in some other videos. Options. Options are contracts that give the holder of the contract the right but not the obligation to buy shares of stock that would be called a call option or sell shares, sell shares of stock and that's known as a put option at a predetermined price and we call that the exercise or the strike price. And the last type of derivative security that I'll mention here is something that's known as a swap. What are swaps? Swaps are agreements between two or more parties to exchange sets of cash flows. So in a simple case, for example, a plain vanilla interest rate swap to financial institutions, for example, might agree to exchange the dollar amount on a floating interest rate security with the dollar, uh, dollar amount on a fixed rate security. So this is a way for a company or an institution that has too much floating rate debt to exchange some for some fixed rate debt and vice versa. 
What are the uses of derivative securities? Well, you may have heard of derivatives some in the news, and they've gotten a bad name. Warren Buffett at one point referred to derivative securities as weapons of mass destruction, but they serve a lot of useful purposes. For example, risk management. This allows market participants to hedge risk. Uh, speculation. Speculation is really what people are concerned about, but speculators serve a purpose because they take the other half of the transaction for the person who's hedging risk. And what speculation does, it is allows market participants to make bets on price changes with only small amounts of money. So they don't have to buy foreign exchange if they're betting that the exchange rate will change. They simply put a small security deposit known as margin down in order to um, hold this position or they could make, uh, they could speculate on the price of wheat or the price of oil, the price of gold, etc. Arbitrage is another use of derivative securities. This allows market participants to take advantage of mispricing of assets in different markets. For example, there should be some relationship between the price of gold delivered today and the price of gold delivered in one year. And if these two prices get out of whack, a futures contract could be used in, in conjunction with buying the asset or, or selling the asset in order to take advantage of this mispricing. Who are the players? Well, you have speculators. Speculators, uh, a speculator would be a trader who enters the futures market in pursuit of a profit and holds only a position in the futures market. So they're betting on a price change. Hedgers. Hedgers are traders who use futures to, produce, uh, to reduce risk. And they'll also have a position in the spot market. So for example, a farmer. A farmer may use a position in the futures market to hedge uh, an adverse change in the price of wheat. So they're going, they have a position in the spot market, they have wheat or they will have wheat when the crop is harvested and they'll enter into a futures contract to hedge the position because if the price of wheat falls they won't make as much money. Airlines use it to, to hedge the price of oil because the price of oil is closely related to those fuel costs that they have to fuel their planes. Uh, arbitrager. An arbitrager is a person who engages in arbitrage and they try and benefit from again that violation of the law of one price. If prices get out of out of line, if they're not what they should be, then an arbitrager may be able to use a futures contract to take advantage of that. What are some of the terms or for a futures contract? What's standardized about it? Well the size of the contract is standardized. In a forward contract you can have any size contract you want but in a futures contract there's a standard size and so if you want a, to hedge a larger position you'll have to buy more contracts. If you want to hedge a smaller position you may not be able to because contracts come in certain size denominations. Uh, the delivery date and the procedure for delivery are standardized. So you can't, you can't just deliver whenever you feel like it. There's a delivery date. There's a procedure for doing it. There's a price at which you can deliver. Sometimes you can deliver different uh, products, but for different prices. If you're entered into a bond futures contract, you may have several different types of bonds you can deliver, but you'll have to make an adjustment based on which ones you, an adjustment in the price you um, receive based on what you deliver. There's something known as daily settlement, which is called marking to market, where essentially the gains and the losses are tallied up each day for all the market participants. I have a separate video discussing marking to market if you're interested in that. And there are margin requirements, that is, Participants are required to put down a bit of a security deposit, and these are standardized. How much do they have to put down in order to um, take on this position? There's also a clearinghouse, and the clearinghouse ensures that the futures contracts 
trade in a smoothly functioning market. They also guarantee uh, that all traders will honor their obligations. So you don't have to worry if you enter into a futures contract that the person on the other side of the transaction doesn't honor their part, doesn't doesn't deliver the good, or doesn't doesn't have the money to pay when you're delivering. This goes through the clearinghouse, and this makes it much better. In a forward contract, you have what's referred to as counterparty risk. That is, you have to worry that the other person doesn't hold up their end of the agreement. In the example I gave of you selling your car to Bob, well, on June 1st, you show up with the car and the title to the car, and Bob says, well, I don't have the money to pay for it. Now, all of a sudden, you're still stuck with the car that you wanted to get rid of. That's not a problem here in the futures market because there's a clearinghouse that takes care of that. Margin requirements. Uh, there are several different types of margin. One is initial margin, which is the amount a trader must de deposit before trading any futures. Then there's what's referred to as maintenance margin, and that's the level that the value of funds on deposit with the broker must fall to before the trader is required to replenish the account to the initial margin. Now, it would be ridiculous if you had to put 2500 you had to have an account balance of $2500 in your account and your account balance fell to uh $2499.99 and your broker called you up and said you had to put another penny into your account. That would be silly. So maintenance margin is going to be lower than the initial margin. And in some cases, you have to bring it back up to the initial margin. In other cases, you only have to bring it back up to the maintenance margin. It depends on what type of uh, contract you're involved in. Uh, variation margin is the amount deposited that brings it back up to either the initial margin or whatever the required margin is. Uh, reading futures quotes, you'll see things like the delivery month. Again, these are standardized, so there are certain months when these contracts are to be delivered. There are things like open prices, open, high, and low prices for the day, which is the same as you would see for stocks, but there's also something referred to as the settlement price. And this is the price at which contracts are settled at the close of the day, and it's not necessarily the last trade price. There's also something referred to as open interest, and these are the number of contracts for which delivery is currently obligated. So if I bought a contract, bought a futures contract, I could also sell an identical contract, and that would close out my position. That would reduce open interest. So here's, here's an example. I went to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and you can see, get an idea of what some contract specifications are like. And this is for lean hog futures contract. And you can see you can get other types of information here, but I only uh, cut and pasted the contract specs. Contract size, 40,000 pounds. So it's a specific size. So if you want to hedge uh, 400,000 pounds of these, you would buy 10 contracts. If you want to hedge 10,000 pounds, well, you can't really do that because this is a, a much larger contract. You know, what's the product description? Hog, and it's the barrow and uh, gilt carcasses. I don't know what that means, but there's something specific. Its pricing is in cents per pound, okay? And there are a lot of these other technicalities that are here. Last trade date and time. The last trade date is the 10th business day of the contract month at 12 p.m. Here's the time that uh, trading takes place, Monday through Friday, 9.05 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Time. How do they go about bidding for these things? It's referred to as open outcry. That's the case where they're on the floor of the exchange and essentially screaming prices, bidding uh, for whatever they want, to, what price they're willing to pay. Here are the contract months, 
February, April, May, June, July, August, October, December. So there's no January, uh, there's no March, etc. So there's some, there's no September, there's no November. Some of the months are, are um, missing, but these are the specific months for this contract. If you want more detail, you can go to the website and click on uh, the settlement procedures. It'll tell you where you have to deliver. Uh, if you choose to deliver, now some a lot of people will just close out their contract. Some contracts say you can just pay cash and you don't you can cash settle the contract. Each one is different. So you can go through and you can look at different types of contracts. And again, they're very specific. If you look at the one for lumber futures, you can't just show up with lumber. You have to show up with specific type of lumber that's of specific lengths and of specific grade. So there's something specific about that. Where it gets delivered, you may have a choice of delivering in Chicago or Kansas City. If you deliver in Kansas City, you may, uh, you may receive less for it. So there are, there are differences in terms of the contract. Actually, I guess the person receiving gets to determine where it's delivered. So they would pay a, actually they would pay a higher price for having it delivered to Kansas City than having it delivered to Chicago where the normal trade takes place. So that's a basic intro to the idea of futures contracts where essentially they're just standardized forward contracts, agreements to make and take delivery of something at a future the, the, the contract is made today, but the agreement to deliver and to pay for it is at some future date.